we really are trying to ask the question on the greatest level of not should it be online, should it be in person, but what in the future is really going to be the right combination. Hi everyone, I'm Amy Devers and this is Clever. Today we're discussing the unique challenges, innovative ideas, and complex decision making of art and design colleges as they adapt to the new realities brought on by this global health crisis in a special program we're calling Learning During a Pandemic and Beyond. This program was recorded via a live Zoom panel in May as part of Wanted Design Online 2020, a conversation series presented with Wanted Design Manhattan, Clever, and Design Milk in response to this year's COVID-related cancellation of NYC by Design. To see the whole program, visit wanteddesignnyc.com slash online. Now, here's the show. Hi everyone, I'm Claire Pijula, co-founder of Wanted Design. Hi everyone, I am Udi Leno, co-founder of Wanted Design. Thank you for joining us. This is our second week of our online series presented with Design Milk and Clever. We hope you had a chance to listen to the Clever podcast with Aisha Bursell, Umberto Campana, Giulio Capellini. And if you haven't, go to cleverpodcast.com and add the podcast to your favorites. It's a particular time for all of us, especially today. We have been uh, the last day of One Design Brooklyn at Industry City, the second day of One Design Manhattan for the first time at the Javits with ACFF. So it's a little bit nostalgic, but we're also very happy to be celebrating with all of you today. It is the 10th anniversary of One Design this year. Um, and we're thrilled to be able to bring a little piece of it online. Yeah, and we want to thank our partners for Wanted Design Conversations for a few years now. Jamie Deringer at Design Milk and uh, Amy Devers at Clever. I have to say that he didn't hesitate one second to join POS with us when we decided to bring this program online. And uh, it was a lot of fun to build this program for you today. Design education is a very essential focus of Wanted Design and we are thrilled to include this discussion today, learning during a pandemic and beyond. So please let me turn to the host today of this discussion, Amy Devers, co-founder of Clever. Thank you, Claire and Odile, and welcome everyone. I'm delighted to introduce our main speakers. Rhode Island School of Design President Roseanne Summerson, Maryland Institute College of Art President Samuel Hoy, and Art Center and College of Design President Lauren Buckman. We're here to break down and address some of the complex challenges and considerations art and design institutions of higher education are facing with the rapid shift to remote learning and the potential ongoing necessity of learning from a distance. As we all witnessed, this semester involved a harrowingly urgent shift to complete remote learning. And now, with uncertainty being the only constant, Leadership is attempting to plan the unplannable. So with the intent of distilling out and sharing the most usable knowledge, we're going to dive right in. I'd like to start with one of the primary concerns. Obviously, the primary concern is the health and safety of students, faculty, and staff. And with that consideration in place, education and learning had to go completely remote this semester. And there's the very obvious problem for art and design education of taking studio-based hands-on learning into the realm of the remote. Now, a lot of people sort of assume that this can't work or that it's impossible, but we know that artists and designers have learned to think nimbly and have come up with non-obvious, innovative, and inventive ways of navigating this new territory. So I'd love to start by hearing some examples of how faculty and students at your institutions have risen to this challenge. Roseanne, do you want to start? I'd love to hear how some of the RISD faculty interpreted this new educational paradigm. Sure. Well, as you can imagine, at a place as complex as any of our institutions, it varied across the spectrum. 
But many of our faculty, because this, the change happens so quickly, and, and I do want to emphasize your earlier points, the speed at which we had to make the change what had a dramatic impact. And I was so impressed with the way our faculty rose to the challenge. Many of them made kits of parts or materials or equipment that they kind of ad hoc threw together so that students could take things home. One of our animation faculty made a pop-up animation studio from a cardboard box. Um, someone teaching optics in the glass department sent students home with prisms and laser pointers and a number of parts for experiments. And the fashion design um, department, our apparel design department, created a platform of working with local materials and in-house bespoke processes. It, you know, I could go on and on and on. There were really dramatic innovations that happened immediately. But some of the most exciting stories have been things that have emerged as artists and designers through this semester have interpreted the challenges in their own ways. I, I don't want to sugarcoat it and say that it worked for everyone. And I don't want to um, say that it wasn't really hard on the students and, and the faculty and staff, but mostly on the students who had everything upended very suddenly and were forced to adjust, you know, not by choice, but by circumstance. But there are many examples, and we've assembled them all in sort of a website of some of the real surprises and discoveries of remote learning. President Buckman, Lauren, do you want to add to this? I'll echo uh, one of the things that Roseanne said for sure, and that people certainly did, as uneven as it was, and, and that's true, people did rise to the challenge. And it was it both compelling and even moving to see how it all evolved and how quickly it evolved. I, I was called to this uh, wonderful book by Rebecca Solnit called uh, Paradise Built in Hell, in which she uh, studies all these disasters and finds how the human spirit is able to triumph and how community evolves and how people are looking out for each other in all kinds of interesting ways at moments of, of challenge and disaster. And we had our kind of own version of that at Art Center as, as people rallied and as an energy kind of grew. The switch to remote, I like to think about it as having certain kinds of guiding principles. One is I think it's always a mistake if the effort is to try to replicate the person-to-person -person experience. That I think what you need to do educationally to be as, as strong as possible is to find what in that particular environment, that online environment, what kind of learning can happen that is so unique to that environment. The parallels I look at are social media didn't replace the, the, uh, the dinner party. Social media was a different way for people to touch in with each other and interact that was unique to that environment. Film didn't replace the theater. Film found its own way of, of storytelling and of, of dramatic presentation. And so if you sort of begin with those, then you, I think you're able to find and to explore and to innovate and to experiment, to find all kinds of things that can be pretty exciting and, and really interesting, which led to this kind of fascinating thing, which was these comments that people would make. We had a virtual graduation at the beginning of May. There was all these comments about how it was, it gave me pause, of course, but the best graduation yet. Or some of the faculty and, and uh, chairs have reported with the students' final work of the spring term, it was the best work I've ever seen. And trying to explore, like, what is, what's that about? Is it just a kind of novelty or people, or is it that we were so kind of terrified and desperate that we simply wanted to, uh, you know, the fact that something worked just became exciting and it, it was magnified in terms of its success? But it, I think it's just an interesting question to explore that there's an intimacy that's coming with all the problems or all the challenges. There are elements of this kind of engagement that is really unique to this environment. There is an intimacy in that graduation, seeing each one of those graduates in their space. We did a whole kind of parade of them surrounded either by family or being alone or being within their own context or being dressed up as they did or creating the background that they did, seeing their excitement, seeing their engagement, seeing them kind of wave almost in a kind of kiss cam way. It was fabulous. It was exciting. And people were deeply moved. So some kind of intimacy happens there. The students in the doing this digital work, some of them claim that they're actually more comfortable, that the shy student is experiencing a kind of learning or ability to come out of his or her shell in a, in a way that doesn't always happen within the context of the live classroom. There are ways in which the pandemic itself becomes a topic of focus. 
in a kind of laboratory in and of itself and create a certain kind of energy. Some faculty are speculating there's a greater demand on precise communication. So there were all these elements that were really, really interesting. The specifics went from the simple, an environmental design class that displayed the idea or the project on film instead of a physical model, color materials and lab classes that had used uh, resourced items in people's living quarters for color palette and form study. ID work became much less about the product itself and more about the, the business model and the uh, business proposition, the manufacturing details, et cetera, et cetera. Th things that could happen again with that environment. And one interesting film class actually used stock footage to kind of create the narrative instead of because they couldn't do the, the shoot with actors and on, a, on, a, on a film stage. And so they actually used stock footage to tell the story. And apparently the quality of that work and the originality of that work was really, really strong. So there's something, again, I don't want to sugarcoat this either, but there's something that triumphed. There's something that came through, through these constraints, which constraints and creativity are interesting relationship that I think was really very, very powerful. That's, that's really inspiring to hear. Sammy Hoy, what was your experience at MICA? Uh, so just like at RISD and at Art Center, likewise at MICA, I've seen incredible uh, responses from both faculty and students, not just to the adjustment to remote modes of um, teaching, learning, and making, but also the specific context of the pandemic. And I'll offer one very concrete example. In our first year experience, this is for uh, freshmen, right? Uh, first year students. It's uh, a project called Pandemic Polemic. So the students examine both their personal and larger social conditions shaped by the pandemic and address them through art and design and through their personal lens. And the outcomes have been a wide ranging, ranging from parodies of Western masterworks as a humorous anecdote to the fear and uncertainty in society, uh, an advocacy website that's been built for Indian migration workers, uh, communication kits that use the uh, kind of dynamics of chain letters, but to promote both health practices and social connections in a time of physical distancing uh, to an app to connect isolated uh, international students uh, in the U.S. Um, a key educational outcome of the first year experience program uh, is for students to connect themselves to their communities and to the larger world and explore the power and responsibility of artists and designers in that connection. And the remote modes of education and the pandemic have just offered new angles for that work. Um, so that's really interesting. Again, reinforcing everything that Roseanne and uh, Lon have said. And the faculty have also worked double and triple time to build new ways to showcase uh, their classes, projects. Um, I think Roseanne gave some examples. Uh, in our cases, they have simulated virtual galleries. Uh, they have uh, presented students' collections now, not only through websites and, and images, but also doing individual podcasts with all these students that are just so wonderful in in. Forming. So I would say, uh, again, echoing something that's been said, we are not going to go back. We're going to harvest a lot of these more inclusive, innovative, and vibrant practices and build that into kind of the new normal when we return uh, to uh, kind of uh, post-COVID-19. I also want to kind of emphasize something that Roseanne and Alon said, which is not to really uh, diminish actually the, um, the shock the disappointment and the difficulties faced by, especially by the students. They were basically cast out of campuses, not with our desire. And that shock and trauma in some way overcome by the vibrant outcomes that we're seeing, I would say is a tremendous testament to the creative nature of our students and faculty. Um, I think uh, the, the, the more traumatic it was, in a way, the more victorious it is now at this end as well. I love to hear this, and I wanted to start off with some good news to hear some stories of resilience and creative adaptation to this challenge. But uh, this abrupt shift to a new mode of learning probably also revealed some hidden inequities, um, things, cracks below the surface. And I want to get your take on what are some of the things you know, as, as designers, we see that as an opportunity because now we know where certain th systems are failing and we can address them. I want to know what are the new things that emerged and that you became aware of during this transition to remote learning and how you'll be factoring this into future educational strategies. And we'll start with you, Sammy. Uh, that's a great question. I think I would say that I suspect that Roseanne and Lon will agree with me as well. Uh, with, um, as you say, w when things being kind of cracked open, Every moment is a soul-searching moment to say, 
you know, is, is the past correct? You know, what's the opportunity in the present and how can we construct a better future? Um, so regarding new, new perspectives that should inform future education strategies, uh, I'm going to actually quote the very eloquent words of one of our current students. I, I don't think I can top him. Uh, his name is uh, Miguel um, Abracelli. He's a MICA MFA student who is a social practice artist an educator, and also an advocate for alternative educational models. And he was interviewed, uh, just as luck had it, by a local magazine called Be More Art Magazine uh, at the time of campus closure. And he was asked, uh, I'm going to read this now, how did the COVID-19 outbreak affect your education at MICA? And he responded, my education is stimulated by the crisis. The art schools have been stripped of galleries, events, laboratories, and other resources. And we had only had two things left, knowledge and community. Schools became only schools, putting in check both the students and the institution itself. What remains to be seen in these months is whether our pedagogical systems are solid enough to approach education from another place, more sensitive to reality, outside our bubbles, and inhabiting a global crisis. I think Miguel is spot on going forward. I think we have to make sure that art and design education has to connect even more to the real world. Uh, and you certainly have three exemplary schools that do that already. So I'm challenging us to do even more um, and become more accessible. Uh, I think uh, the um, social inequality, the high tuition, uh, I think the mode of education that we have, I would challenge us to say that we are not being as accessible as we can. And very importantly, um, I think the value of artists and designers are in our hand to prove to the world. And we have to also make art ed education uh, even more understood and embraced by not only policymakers, but really the, a large segment of society and um, industry so that we can exercise the power and the influence that we should have. Wonderful. I love that you read that quote from one of your students. President Buckman, Lauren, what's your take on some of the, the fractures and the additional challenges that emerged during this that you'll have to factor into future learning. Yeah, um, I just want to echo that. that is, that's just a beautiful bit of writing, Sammy. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, I think I'd take this question by talking about some of the personal issues that our students are facing and some of our faculty as well. First of all, there's just the, the huge burden of what it costs to go to college and, and what our students are bearing. And they've got it down to a kind of precision. And when they're trying to work their way through college and they lose their jobs. There's a whole level of vulnerability that emerges. And a lot of students have written to me about their families and their families being out of work and this kind of system of support that they had, had developed and now their families are out of work and not able to support them. So the college has had to rally with emergency funding to, to help students to deal with food insecurity, housing insecurity, a lot of tuition delay payments, et cetera, et cetera, a lot of challenges that students are facing, which of course, as that stress builds, it affects their learning, their capacity to open, their capacity to engage in the fullest possible way. Other kinds of interesting ways in which students, you know, as much as some students felt more comfortable, other students felt embarrassed. They felt embarrassed that people would see their environment, that it was too humble, or that it, it was something that they felt like they, they didn't want to share with their fellow uh, classmates. And that they also felt um, too much of the gaze on them and that they became very self-conscious in this kind of Zoom environment. And for however they had constructed mechanisms to kind of uh, hide from that a little bit in a person-to-person -person environment, within the context of Zoom, it became very intense and they became self-conscious, I think, and uh, felt that too kind of interfered with the, with the learning. Some of them expressed a great fatigue. All of us have talked about Zoom fatigue, but when you think about it within the context of the classroom and what happens and how can faculty ensure students are engaged, but at the same time kind of let them free and just trying to balance those personal and social dynamics has become a really complicated pedagogical challenge. And then finally, I would say that, that facing all of the obvious challenges of, you know, they don't have access to shops anymore. They don't have access to labs anymore. How do they accommodate that? How do they switch? How do they use what they have? How do they create makeshift studio spaces? Um, we have a service bureau so they can send in a file and we can make it for them and send it back to them, but that becomes a very complicated process as well. So trying to get at all of these issues to be sensitive to people's different kinds of positions, people's different kinds of sensitivities, and also sort of the, the, the resourcefulness that they need to be able to gather up 
different ways of, of making in different contexts and spaces and materials of making has all become a very, very interesting, but very, very difficult challenge. What I love about this discussion is all of the things that you guys are attempting to navigate with empathy and sensitivity and, and real thoughtfulness in terms of the ecosystem of the arts and design education world can also be a template for greater society moving forward. And Roseanne, I'd love to hear what was revealed to you at RISD or how you're thinking about this new awareness that'll be factored into strategic learning. I'm glad that you connect it to the the larger societal issues, because I think we're making these same discoveries in different fashions at different levels across the globe. You know, specifically in our student population, we saw immediate social equity differences in terms of having to ship a lot of computers and software and, and even set up hotspots for students that didn't have access to the internet, things that were logistical that in some cases, as one of my colleagues said could feel embarrassing, but we had to face them head on to make it work. But there are also subtle things like sharing uh, bedrooms with siblings who are also doing remote learning at different levels of their education. So these assumptions that we might have made at the beginning that students would be able to work in these remote platforms uh, across the board became challenged right away. And we had to realize that there are very different levels of socioeconomics in our student body. A lot of the students who are first generation students who were trying to do projects that within their family apartment or the, in, in a public space within their family felt it was very difficult to have people questioning what they were doing because they couldn't understand all of the implications or the, the purposes of everything that the students were doing. So that, they, then they were juggling you know, various factors Another thing I, I think that became really difficult, and, and I can't imagine doing this, but on the one hand, you are your art school student in your class on Zoom with your peers. And on the other hand, you know, the back of you is your childhood home. And for many college students, there is a tremendous evolution of their identity in all kinds of ways. And so you almost have one face to who you are in your art school world and another to who you were, you know, when you left to go to your art school world. And navigating that for students was highly anxiety producing, as you can imagine, and for good reason. So I think some of the um, the anxiousness was, I mean, we, we found ways, we continued counseling and numbers of others of support things, but just seeing that head on is kind of a microcosm for what a lot of people are experiencing around the world. And as Lauren said, some of these uh, students were worried because their parents had lost their jobs. We had huge emergency funds. Our own students um, created a GoFundMe fund, which helped as well. We, we did a, a large push for financial aid, which was a challenge financially for us because of the financial implications about this, but we felt an obligation to our families and our students. Uh, and that is going to be an ongoing challenge. But, um, you know, when you bring it to the larger society, we see it in terms of who has access to safety equipment and gear, who has access to good medical um, plans, who has access to even safe spaces where they're not clustered with large families or other groups of people who has access, who can afford delivery services, who has to go out and interact in the world. There are all these different issues that really became exposed across not just education, but across all the societal implications of this pandemic. And these are things that designers and artists care deeply about. And I think they're huge opportunities for us to look at in terms of our commitments to just societies and to designing more humane futures. There are tremendous design opportunities and all of the um, obstacles and problems that were uncovered by this pandemic. Absolutely. And one of the things that I read in researching this is, you know, Sammy had mentioned the rethinking a new normal, but on the MICA website, you're not rethinking a new normal. It says that you're thinking of a better normal. So we're faced with this opportunity to sort of distill out all the good things to keep 
and to improve the things where we see weaknesses and fractures. And then to set that as an example um, that can be implemented at other educational institutions, but also in civic design strategy, in policy making, and in society at, at large. Um, but in order to do that, you guys have to stay afloat economically. And this has been a, an incredible challenge for the institution, for the students, both. And I want to talk quickly about how we can manage the economic challenges for both the students and the institution moving forward. Obviously, you took a big hit this year, but now we've got to look at the future. So what does that look like for the students? Actually, let's start with, with you, Sammy, and if you can talk a little bit about the student and the institutional perspective, that would be great. Sure. Uh, I think uh, we are all looking at um, caring for our students, not just education, but their personal well-being and the physical well-being. And as you know, physical health is actually part of mental health and physical health as well. Um, so uh, the MICA board and administration are acutely aware of the financial stress on our students and their families. And we wanted to, and we have um, uh, kind of assisted where we can and should. Uh, so um, I think uh, both uh, RISTI and MICA, I think have a similar uh, measure. We gave uh, $150 out to all students on financial aid uh, from the get-go as soon as the, the crisis you know, onset, just to put some cash you know, in their hands. And there was no application process. And also we prorated uh, the uh, room and board you know, for students in the dormitory very quickly and did payments in two ways so we can get cash right in their hands and then calculate the balance later on and not hold the balance, uh, you know, delay. And like uh, Risti and Rosanna, I'm sure, Art Center too, uh, we have an angel fund at MICA that we have raised money uh, to enhance. And then also we got a federal CARES money uh, as quickly as possible to come and infuse uh, that kind of, you know, funding to students. So the, uh, I think we need to also address a, a question heads on as part of institutional care. Uh, many students right now across the country uh, and certainly our three institutions also want tuition refund. So that's the one aspect that we basically have said, no, we cannot do that without ruining the institution because I think students and families feel that we're saving a lot of money uh, by uh, moving to remote uh, education. And the fact is that uh, actually we are retaining all the faculty and staff who are working even more <laughs> to uh, deliver a, a different kind of education and the facilities uh, while being idled actually still have carrying costs. And this actually came in the last quarter of the uh, fiscal year for many of us. So the saving is really not that much. So we have to explain very carefully to students and, and families that despite our care and wanting to help, that's the one area that we feel that we actually have uh, provided continuous education that allowed them to complete the semester and finish the degrees. So we are not offering you know, tuition uh, refunds. But aside from that, um, the institution itself is also planning for uh, taking care of ourselves, just like in the airplane. If you put the um, kind of oxygen mask on, you have to have actually the, um, the institution do that first. Um, so we are um, looking ahead to say, how can we look at um, not only the very difficult this year, but next year actually is even more difficult. At MICA, we believe actually we can scrape by this year and maybe even have a balanced budget year, which is amazing. But next year, uh, the, the, uh, it's going to be tremendously, tremendously difficult. And this is not just us, uh, the art schools, but the entire higher education you know, sector. So how do we go forward uh, with uh, the whole campus team coming together as one single unit to say we're going to endure some pain and sacrifices, but at the same time, knowing that we're also doing it in a strategic way, that we're going to actually come out of it better and more resilient and bolder and for that better normal. Uh, so we uh, just very quickly at MICA, we put together what we call a R5 roadmap. Uh, it's the R5 stands for five R's, uh, respond, uh, reopen, recover, reimagine, and remake. Um, so we actually uh, combine together into one single thread uh, this um, uh, uh, kind of actions that uh, we're going to be very responsible and do very agile and respond to immediate crisis. We're going to aim to uh, get through, strive through uh, with minimum, minimum harm, but at the same time, harvest from it all the lessons that we have learned, all the productive ruptures, and make sure that we think about the future in a positive way. And that roadmap has been shared with um, everyone on, 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 um, on campus, including parents. And the response has been actually incredibly positive. Um, and people are really looking for, we're still building those teams right now, kind of going forward. So the proof is that are putting devils in the details, but as a uh, framework of actually getting the college going forward as so a one team has been um, a very, very useful. And that's our goal is to not be um, a fringe from 
the short-term sacrifices and pain, but make sure that the longer-term uh, positive, positive outcome, not just for the school, but for society. Like Roseanne said, this is a great opportunity for us to rethink how can we have a more just society and more just education going forward is our larger aim. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure that transparency is appreciated by all so they can see how your decision making is working and being implemented and they right. understand. Yeah, I've never had conducted as many town halls and I just came from one into this meeting and I think Roseanne and Ron, Ron probably are doing the same. I think right now communication is absolutely key. Roseanne, what would you say about the economic challenges from the student perspective and from the institution perspective? It's huge. I mean, I, I won't beat around the bush. This is an enormous component of things we have to solve here. You know, in addition to the added expenses, we lost a lot of revenue. We had to cancel a lot of programming, all of our continuing ed. Our whole museum had to close and we had no admissions. And, you know, we have a lot of events that were scheduled that generate revenue. And, you know, we're always trying to come up with a model for education, knowing how hard the formula is to augment the dependence on tuition with other forms of revenue, which pretty much all got canceled. So, and we also paid all of our, you know, everyone, including all of our student workers, even though many of them weren't doing campus jobs, just because we knew they relied on that money. And we did give prorated housing refunds. So, our immediate year, this year and next year, is already challenged. Moving forward, we're really going to have to look at what higher education means post-COVID. And there are going to have to be some very tough decisions. I don't think that the model that we are used to operating under will still be the model that will make sense moving forward. And it's not just financially speaking. I think you know, I, I've been talking about it as the new abnormal. I don't think we can ever go back to where we were. Um, everything, every industry has changed. Every kind of work has changed. I'm on an executive um, advisory board with business leaders and our um, government officials. And hearing the changes that are happening in every industry and in every workforce and in, in, um, in the way that property is used and leased and work from home, challenges and the way that jobs are going to be configured and thought of, the way that food is delivered, the way that transportation will happen, everything is going to change. So it would not make sense at all if education, which is sort of leading the future, educating the next generation, also didn't make massive changes. So the big question is going to be how to decide what those changes are in a very positive way using the brain trust of faculty and students and staff and board, et cetera, to figure out what education can contribute to defining a future landscape, which doesn't just respond to the pandemic, but actually takes our creativity and our empathy and our passion and helps to move it forward in a way that will affect certainly society, but also the whole construct of art and design education. I think to do anything less at this point in some ways is irresponsible. I think that's really well said. And I would only add to your comment, Roseanne, that it often gets uh, confined in the language of online or face-to-face, -face. Mm -hmm. but it's not that binary. I think we need to be much more expansive in the way we think about it and the kinds of questions we ask in the ways we conceive of that kind of relationship to get the most creative, most uh, exciting, richest, most meaningful new structure, new architecture possible. Yeah, it's. I, I love that you're framing it as not reacting to a crisis, but actually mobilizing to create a situation in which we can thrive in the new post-pandemic situation. And that's really where I think art and design and nimble thinking and creative thinking can set an example and be a real asset to society at large. And anytime there's a mass retooling of anything, it's incredibly economically expensive and turbulent. And now we, we got to think about the fall semester and how in the summer semester and how to move forward in a situation that's still unfolding and that's still very uncertain. And what I'm seeing from all of you, you've talked about it a little bit, is you've put together these sort of systems for planning that have to be fine-tuned and take into account new data from the brain trust, 
almost every day. And those systems have to be flexible and agile and very responsive. Can you talk about those systems? Because I think there's a lot to be learned from that, both for other institutions, but also for just everybody out there is trying to navigate uncertainty. And I think creatives know how to do that with a little bit more flexibility. So I'd love to hear how you're planning the unplannable. Um, let's, let's start with you, Roseanne. Sure. So um, I think all of us probably have task forces and working groups in every kind of configuration one could imagine. In our case, we created um, six working groups initially that were each taking and analyzing a particular part based primarily on the academic programs. We set up a framework first that said that there were three priorities that had to be addressed in order. The first was the health and safety of the entire community and our the communities that we impact. The second was our academic integrity of all of our programs. And the third was institutional sustainability. So that became a, you know, we, we, we tested some things and they worked in one, but not all three. So we were coming up with plans that actually addressed all three of those issues. And um, we had a number of groups that looked at specific aspects of what make sense moving forward. And as we got further into that work, and actually we just had a draft of that plan, I just received it last night, um, and it's with all the committee work together and we're analyzing it today and tomorrow to come up with an actual response. But uh, one of the things that we realized is that we also needed a decision-making framework. So we developed that to say, how are we going to make decisions? And one thing about a community, a successful functional community, is that the voices at every level are so important. It's not just administrative. So all of these committees included students, staff, faculty, um, academic administrators, and senior administrators. And we've been checking in regularly with our board. But, you know, there's there can be one little comment that a student would make that will just turn the whole planning process in a new direction because it's something that we hadn't experienced or considered. So the time-consuming nature of being so inclusive is a little bit exhausting, but it is absolutely necessary to come out with results that actually are meaningful to the community. And then the second piece, which Sammy touched on, is the communication piece. You know, we're doing, I was originally doing a daily, I was calling it, which was a summary every day. Now it's three times a week. We've also done a number of town halls and specific, you know, communications to alumni, to parents, to board, et cetera. The fact of making a, a community feel like one community, even in all of its disparate parts, is so important to making us um, be able to take this enormous challenge and move it forward in the best possible way. So engaging everyone in both the brainstorming level and the uh, kind of communication um, an outreach level has been essential to the success, I think, of these planning processes. Having said that, we're still not decided about what we're doing. We will have a decision by June 15. But um, we were hoping that there would be more clarity from external sources. But those have, in fact, in some ways impeded our ability to move forward. We have very good relationships with our governor and within the state and our federal representatives. But Beyond that, you know, access to testing, um, numbers of health protocols, those are, are so uh, sporadic and changing so much that we had to actually hire our own consultants and rely on our own sort of data-driven research to come up with how we were going to figure out the processes that made sense for our institution. Lauren, uh, what are you employing at Art Center as a strategy? You know, it begins with kind of echoing something that you suggested uh, in your comment earlier, and that is that um, artists and designers do know something about the space of uncertainty because it is ultimately a very creative space. And um, the, the work that artists and designers do is so often going into places of the unknown and they create and they make and they, they do in order to discover what it is that can um, be, be born of that work and of that making. And, and so uh, I do think that artists and designers hold a kind of special uh, perspective in all of this, that, that because they know the richness, um, as scary as a, a space as uncertainty is, they know the richness of it and all the potential that can come from it. Um, and so 
we really are trying to ask the question on the greatest level of not should it be online, should it be in person, but what in the future is really going to be the right kind of the right combination? What are the learning modalities that are going to make a difference? What can be online? What needs to be uh, uh, person to person? How do we explore a very nuanced kind of configuration of ways of learning and different kinds of approaches that we want to take? I think the other thing too that. I certainly think Art Center's up against, and I'm pretty sure RISD and Mike are as well. And that is, you know, these small art and specialized tuition dependent institutions are facing and have faced for years, but, but man, the day of reckoning seems to have come of how we just can't continue this model. We just can't keep on creating that tuition increase every year and students borrowing more money and all of the expenses that are associated with it not only because it's unsustainable and borderline unethical in terms of the amount of debt that our students have to take on and all of the deep worries that are associated with that, but also because it's just, it's just going to all blow up. I mean, we don't have the, the, the means to keep that model going. And there was a horizon out there that we were thinking about. How do we build a model that mitigates tuition dependency? Because right now we are limited. It's an old fashioned model. It doesn't work anymore. And we're coming to the end of it. And what happened with this pandemic, as far as I'm concerned, is that it accelerated that process. And that horizon came and found us. And now we need to respond. And now we need to be innovative. And now we need to go into those places of uncertainty. And we need to create. And we need to make. And we need to experiment. And we need to innovate. And so far, the little tastes of that, the hints of that, that have come through our process, students are picking up on it and they're engaging with us and they're getting excited about it. And we just started our summer term and we are fully enrolled, completely online. Most of that had to do with the energy that was coming from faculty and chairs about their excitement of this experimentation, of their excitement of what it means to go into this place of uncertainty but we need to do it on the larger scale of the institutions as well and really get at this tuition dependent uh, academic model, which I think has come to the end of its days. I think you touched on something I hadn't really internalized, but that students are part and parcel of this whole program in terms of having a sense of agency to create what that better normal is, what the new model of education is. And because they have that investment and ownership they can get excited and inspired about it. It's not being fed to them by the powers that be. They're the architects of it alongside with the institutions. And I think that's a really right. powerful space to be in. And We're, they know something and they understand something that, that we don't. And Roseanne's absolutely right. One word from a student can shift perspective in the most important way. We're going to take questions from the audience in just a little bit, so make sure to go ahead and submit your questions via the Q&A button, either at the top or the bottom of your Zoom window. Before we wrap things up, did you have anything you wanted to say on that topic? Sammy, you were pretty clear on your planning process through the five R's. Yeah, yeah. I just add uh, that, Amy, your, I love the word, kind of planning for the unplannable. I think the only way to go forward is really work with multiple scenarios and strive to achieve the best while, you know, ready to cope with other, you know, possibilities. And, and, and that's, as um, Lauren and uh, Roseanne pointed out, that is so akin to the creative process. We are all about iteration and reiteration based on, um, you know, the, the stimuli that are uh, coming. So because of that, as a community, I think we do have the opportunity uh, to um, shape with that. And, and in terms of our uh, our five or five hours roadmap going forward, I think the one that really excites the Mike me the most is the um, reimagine and remake. And I think uh, we will have a chance to remake not only ourselves, our model, but hopefully contributing to uh, remaking of society at large. Of course, we are not in such power. We can remake society at large, but I think we can put forth the change agents, creative change, change agents who can help with that remaking process. Well, with that in mind, I'd, I'd love to talk to you about how the various institutions are networking together to share this brain trust, to share what's working, what's not working. The insight of a student at RISD would obviously benefit the Art Center community, the planning committee at MICA. And there are myriad, multiple, smaller institutions that are maybe don't have as much access or resources that could benefit from being part of a larger network. Is something like that happening? Is there a special council uh, <laughs> where you can all compare notes, share information, and sort of strengthen numbers? 
I volunteer alone to start that because he's actually the chair of the Association of Independent College of Art and Design or the current board that Roseanne and I both belong to. <laughs> One of the great joys of, of this work is really having, having colleagues like Roseanne and Sammy and being able to share our ideas and to, um, there's so much creative possibility in the ways in which we can talk to each other and we can collaborate, we can share our, both our achievements and our war stories and, and, and really be able to discover what, what the possibility is. And I've learned an enormous amount from both of them. And that extends to um, this Association of Independent Colleges of Art and Design called ACAD, in which we've had regular meetings of presidential leadership. The CFOs have met, deans of students have met, admissions teams have met, all of them collaborating on these questions of what might be possible, how we can share best practices, how we can share the kinds of questions we're trying to address to get as deep as we possibly can into what our challenges are and how we've come up, um, uh, each come up with different kinds of solutions. I will say, um, and this is just a kind of delight of the world somehow, but I always wonder at the power of the zeitgeist because I will talk to Sammy or to Roseanne or to another president about a certain idea, convinced that our centers come up with the original great new idea, right? And it's already going on at RISD and like, you know, or, and this kind of thing when we don't even talk to each other and yet we are, there, there's so many different ways in which uh, very similar kinds of things are emerging. And that becomes, you know, really fertile ground and really exciting and really wonderful way for us to learn and to collaborate and, and really thank goodness for, for colleagues like this and for our ability to connect in this particular way. I find it energizing and, and as I say, quite nourishing. I was just going to add to that, that I think one of the reasons it works is that we all um, really know who we are as institutions and all really respect each other's institutions. It's not competitive. And I think uh, because we are sort of a specialized group of educators in terms of art and the art and design um, genre, there is enormous respect across the board so that, and we need each other. And there is a wonderful opportunity to learn from one another. And I think in this pandemic, that community has really expanded to the number of things like this, venues like this, podcasts, and conversations, across professionals, across educators, uh, across employees, all looking at how we can take that sense of sharing knowledge and learning and growing through this together because it's, it is, I mean, we're all sick of the word unprecedented, but it really is the most extraordinary challenge we've ever faced in, certainly in my professional life in running anything. Um, and I think a lot of people are feeling that. So that sense of knowing who you are, respecting your peers and feeling that you have that the only way this is going to work is with hands out to one another, that that is something we can all take from this particular moment in time. Yeah, I'll just add that. I think one of the most exciting developments at ACAD is that, um, Amy, you correctly identify students being the center of everything that we do. Um, and I think since uh, last year, because of our diversity, equity, inclusion effort, uh, students are now connecting across um, you know, campuses. And, um, and so we are actually building pipelines for uh, you know, more diverse students to come into our you know, teaching force and they're having conversations. I think that's going to be enhance a lot of our learning in another way uh, kind of going forward. Well, I, I'm so excited that we were able to put this conversation together, and I want to get to questions because I know there are a lot. We have one from anonymous attendee. How should students keep their creativity and studio environment alive in a digital learning environment if COVID-19 causes campuses to stay closed for the upcoming fall semester, especially for students in majors that use physical deliverables as a critical part in the design process? Well, uh, well, first of all, uh, I think uh, it's been amazing. I think we, we all, all three of us gave some examples. I think faculty and students have found a really creative way to find um, existing resources within the home. We had students who replicated over two or three days and time-lapse videos of how they actually turned their home into a, a thesis exhibition you know, environment. Um, so I think there are ways to do that, but at the same time, there are certain elements of a art and design education uh, that really cannot completely be replicated. And therefore, we are also looking really our hardest to, to say, um, what are the stopgap measures, but how can we return to um, a new kind of better, more hybridized, uh, more thoughtful, more accessible kind of environment in the future that definitely will provide 
uh, some of the essential essential elements of art and science education, which is uh, you know studios, uh, facilities. We do not have time to talk about you know how does that work in a physical distancing environment. But as soon as we are allowed to reopen, if, even if there are health uh, public health measures in place, uh, health and safety comes first. For example, we are already rearranging all the ceramic wheels so that they are uh, you know a distance enough that we can have uh, classes. Classes might be uh, shifted in. Uh, you know, two shifts instead of, uh, you know, one one whole class, etc. So we are very eager to return to the kind of art and science education that will allow for uh, kind of that, that in-person and access to, to facilities. But in the meantime, because we are a resourceful and creative community, I think we will be able to find uh, meaningful ways that will challenge uh, students' creativity and have them rise to the occasion. But I don't think for, uh, it can be forever. Understood. I think there's a lot of opportunity for cross-pollination of technique, technical information as well. I know as a, as a furniture designer that I learned just as much from sewing and garment construction about form and composition. And so I think there are ways that students can engage at home with different materials but still apply it to a, a different discipline because that cross-pollination is also, for me, that's where that's where the magic is. Yeah. That's where you find un, unforeseen connections. And I, I'm sure Roseanne and Lorne have things to say, so I won't dominate. But I say you know, virtual reality is a really, really um, a huge um, you know, asset. So we had actually product design classes now where students actually created almost tactile, uh, you know, visually tactile elements they can place in real environment. So everything is actually simulated to such a degree uh, that again, it will change us as to think about how do we present projects and think about you know productions kind of going forward. So I think there are alternatives, as you mentioned. Okay, here's another one from Christine Goldman. Wondering what campus housing will look like in the fall in particular. How do you plan to keep students safe in dense living environments such as dormitories? Let's throw this one to Roseanne. Well, uh, as I said, we're still in the planning phase to decide what we're doing. But if we do have students on campus, they, they will be in single rooms. And, um, you know, we're part of one of our task forces is developing a whole strategy around a distanced campus that includes housing and dining. You know, we have um, 162 students on campus that didn't, that weren't able to leave for various reasons who are still on our campus. They've all been following the protocols of all the health recommendations that are in the state, which, you know, I, th I don't have to repeat them. Everyone knows them, you know, the disinfecting, the social distancing, the mask, et cetera. And we've done food delivery service and the whole thing has worked beautifully. And, you know, I'm really proud of the fact that with all of this upheaval, with no warning, all of our students either got out safely to places where they were safe without having COVID or remained on campus safely and without having COVID. So there are a lot of things that one can put in place to ensure to the best of our abilities that we're following health protocols, which are the same protocols that, that they're using in other contexts, not just housing, to ensure that the health commitment is there. I think the idea of the keg party, um, which is not something that we all have very much in our schools anyway, I think that's going to the wayside for a while. But there, you know, it's more, I think in our instances, even more than housing, which is somewhat easy, I think, to regulate, it's more the notion of uh, students in facilities who were collaborating before. It's all the complexities of the workspaces that are really the things that need careful thought. I think the housing is a little easier in a way. So we're running out of time, so I feel like we should wrap things up. We do have a ton more questions, though. So we tried to get to all of them, but there are a lot more. So I want to invite everyone to continue the conversation with us on Instagram at Wanted Design. And I want to thank President Summerson, President Hoy, and President Buckman for this really compelling conversation, but also for the thoughtful way you're leading your institutions through this crisis. And of course, I want to thank Design Milk and huge thanks to Claire Pijula and Odile Henoff, the organizers of Wanted Design and this conversation series. Thanks for listening. To view the replay or check out the rest of the Wanted Design Online 2020 conversation series, go to wanteddesignnyc.com slash online. Our website is cleverpodcast.com, where you can sign up for our newsletter and subscribe to Clever on your favorite podcast app. We love hearing from you on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. 
You can find us at Clever Podcast, and you can find me at Amy Devers. Clever is produced by 2VDE Media, with editing by Rich Straffolino and music by L1011. Clever is proudly distributed by Design Milk.